months some time ago. A guy that lives in a state that looks like a giant oven mitt decided to start his own podcast. He's cooler than you. His favorite pizza topping is pineapple because he knows it makes you angry. This is Cujo's Corner. Hello, hello, everyone. I have returned with another edition of Cujo's Corner. Before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone out there, how are you all doing today? I'm doing good. Really excited to be doing another podcast, coming at you with some more uh, some more sports talk. Uh, finally, some stuff to talk about. Um, it has been a couple of weeks since I've uploaded a, uh, a podcast. Uh, to be honest, guys, I kind of wanted to take a break. Um, plus, there just wasn't really a whole lot to talk about. If I'm, if I'm being honest here, I didn't really feel the need to try to force a podcast that really just wouldn't have had a whole lot to talk about. But, uh, yeah, we got a lot of crazy trades in the NFL to discuss. Um, <coughs> we're going to mix in a little bit of some baseball in there. And, of course, as always, we're going to end things off with an embarrassing story. Um, anyway, guys, with all that said... Let's get started with some crazy NFL talk. A lot of trades happening before free agency, which officially kicked off today, I might add. Um, not really going to talk about anything as far as free agency goes. Uh, uh, really, you know, the Patriots haven't really done much, and I, I don't really feel like talking about any other team. Uh, although I am going to talk a little bit about the Lions and what I think they should do. Um... Oh, and uh, you may not see it on the screen uh, because I got this news after I made all I I'd already made the title card. Uh, Tom Brady has announced that he's uh, coming out of retirement. He made the announcement last night on Twitter, I believe it was. Uh, says that his place is in the, is on the field, not in the stands. That time will come. Uh, you know, I, uh, I gotta be honest, guys, I, I, I feel a little mixed on this. Like, anyone that knows me knows I'm a Tom Brady fan. I've, uh, Brady is my idol, one of my idols. Uh, I've looked up to the man since I was a kid, and, you know, I, I, there is a part of me that is happy that he is coming back, but I, you know, I don't know. I felt like... I felt like he had nothing to prove. He has really nothing left to prove. He could he could retire on top. Um, you know, well, not on top. I mean, it, they did lose in the in the divisional round of the NFC playoffs, but um, nonetheless, you know, went out still in his you know still being able to play in good health. Uh, I, I thought it was you know. Probably the perfect time for him to finally call it a career, but apparently he don't think so. So, yeah, Brady's back. Um, <laughs> that's about all I have to say about it. To be honest, guys, I, I really don't have a whole lot to say about it. Uh, there's a part of me that's happy about it. There's a part of me that's kind of bummed. I, you know, for me, I, I felt a little sentimental when I when I said what I said about, you know, uh, when, when Brady first announced his retirement i mean i guess that didn't last um though i guess you know before i make any uh and before any brett Favre comparisons come in uh let me just add he technically didn't file his paperwork for retirement so he didn't technically retire so much as he just announced that he was retiring and just never followed through with it um that said, I do think uh, it does kind of remind me a little bit of Brett Favre, but not quite. We're not quite there yet. But, you know, and I guess one thing I do want to say is, uh, like, Brady says he's got unfinished business. I, I Personally, I'd like to know what that means. The dude has literally done everything. <laughs> he doesn't have anything left to prove, but... 
I'm not going to tell the guy what he should or shouldn't do with his life. And, hey, you know what? At the end of the day, there is a part of me that's happy that he's coming back. Uh, I, you know, I guess that's the nine-year-old kid in me that is happy about that. You know, that, that Birdie's going to is going to give us at least one more year. I uh, I really would not be surprised if, it, if this coming season was his last year, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, but, yeah, Birdie's back. I, I just kind of felt like giving that a couple of minutes, get that out of the way real quick. Uh, now let's get to the good stuff. So there were a lot of trades that happened in the NFL up to uh, – up to this point, and uh, for the record, uh, free agency actually, I believe, just started today. I'm not sure. 100%, I think it might be Wednesday. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's March 14th or March 16th or whatever. Um, feel free to correct me in the comment section below. But anyway, so about these trades. Let's start with the first one that I'm sure got everyone's attention. So the Seattle Seahawks sent Russell Wilson to the Denver Broncos. Uh, Denver is getting uh, Russell Wilson in a 2022 fourth-round pick. Seattle's getting Drew Locke, Noah Fant, Shelby Harris. Denver's 2022 first-round pick, which is the ninth overall pick. Their 2022 second-round pick, which is 40th overall Denver's 2023 first and second round picks, and Denver's 2022 fifth round pick. Okay. So when I first saw this, this kind of made my head spin. Now, there was all kinds of speculation about, like, oh, is Seattle going to trade Russell Wilson? Are they going to get rid of Russell Wilson? Oh, Russell Wilson doesn't like it in Seattle anymore. He's going to get traded. And it was kind of one of those things where <clears throat> I had always kind of like low-key believed it, but never wanted to quite say that, like, I firmly believed that a trade was going to happen. Um, because there was a part of me that was thinking, no, Seattle would rather build around the guy and keep him around, but no, I guess not. Uh, they've pretty much said screw it we're gonna we're gonna do a rebuild and Russ didn't want to be a part of that understandable uh so yeah and I think for Denver I think this was plan b and that's not to say that Russell Wilson is back quarterback but I think Denver was kind of hoping to get Aaron Rodgers uh, you know the hiring of uh Nathaniel Hackett and just all the moves they were making seemed to point in the direction that they were going to make a move for Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers was the guy that they were hoping to get. That was plan A. And he signed an extension with Green Bay. So, obviously that wasn't going to happen. So they did the next best thing. They went to Seattle and unloaded their future to get Russell Wilson and a fourth-round pick. So, I was talking to a buddy of mine about this trade, and I, I didn't look any of this up I didn't look into this to to see what was being said um but he was telling me that a lot of people were saying oh Seattle ripped themselves off oh I can't believe they gave up Wilson for so like such a little amount I gotta be honest if that's the consensus if the consensus is that oh Denver ran away with this trade oh 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 I have to say, I think I'm in the minority on this, but I disagree. Now, that's not to say that Seattle just outright won the trade. I mean, we'll see. Let's see how far Russ takes Denver. Uh, it's kind of like a Detroit Matt Stafford thing in that regard. But i got to be honest. I don't know how you look at what Seattle got in return and think, oh, they lost this trade. Oh, like I, I just don't. I really don't. Now, Drew Locke is nothing to write home about. Uh, Noah Fant, I, you know, I really couldn't tell you a whole lot if he's any good or not. I don't know anything about Shelby, uh, Shelby Harris. But Seattle got a top 10 pick for this year's draft, and they got a first-round pick for next year, and a second-round pick for next year. Not to mention, they got Denver's second-round pick for this year, and they got their fifth-round pick. I mean... 
their future, the draft capital they got, is insane here. I actually think if Seattle plays their cards right, they easily could run away with this one. And again, it all depends on how far Russell Wilson takes the Broncos. I think it is easy to kind of look at this and go, ah, well, Russell Wilson's Russell Wilson, so he'll take Denver far, ah. But, again, only time will tell. I'm not going to make any predictions on that. I I think you guys know how good I am at making predictions at this point. (laughs) Um, So... I will just say this. I don't want to sit here. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, like, oh, Seattle won the trade or, oh, Denver won the trade. I don't know. This is one of those trades that where we're going to have to see how this plays out. But to say, I, I just think if the consensus is that, like, Denver easily, like, quote-unquote, easily won this trade, I don't agree with that. I think Seattle got a pretty decent package in return. Uh, again, Drew Locke is nothing to write home about. No offense, I couldn't really tell you a lot. And Shelby Harris, I couldn't tell you anything about. But the draft picks that they got, I think Seattle actually did pretty well here. Denver, um, they unloaded their future. For them, this has to work. This has to be, at bare minimum, a Super Bowl appearance, or this trade is a bust on Denver's part. Denver is doing what the L.A. Rams and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers over the past couple of years have done. They're essentially doing the NFL's version of a super team. You know what? Why not? It could be a lot of fun. Watching Denver, Kansas City twice a year is going to be freaking insane. Uh, Let's also not discount what L.A. is doing, the Chargers, you know, what they're doing. They just signed J.C. Jackson today. They also got Khalil Mack in a trade, and we'll we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, But... And, and look, don't underestimate the Vegas Raiders, man. I mean, I don't know how Josh McDaniels is going to work as a coach. I'm not too confident in him, but you just never know. The Raiders are, they, they could be a sleeper team. The AFC West is going to be, in, I, I don't think it's bold to say this, I think the AFC West is going to be the best division in football next year. And I don't really think it's going to be that close. And again, I don't think it's bold to say that, and we'll talk more about the other trade that happened in this division, but I again, I think it's safe to say the AFC West is going to run away with as far as like best division in football this year. I don't think it's going to be close. So, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, I want to kind of tie this back to the Patriots real quick before we move on to uh, the next trade I want to talk about. Um, And it's very simple. It's how this impacts the Patriots. Well, it's very simple, guys. They're in the AFC. And if we are, if the Patriots are going to plan to contend, we might have to go through Denver. You never know. I mean, with how Denver is putting this all together, they really are going all or nothing here. And that could mean that the Patriots may have to see them in the playoffs. So, while I say it's going to be fun could also work against this in a way, but it's football and I'm here for it. Okay, so the next trade I want to talk about is the Indianapolis Colts, the the trade involving Indy and Washington. Uh, So Indy sends, Indy sent Carson Wentz to the Washington Commanders uh, for a 2022 third round pick, Washington's 2022 third round pick, and Washington's 2023 third-round pick. That can become a second-round pick if Wentz plays 70% of snaps this season. So uh, so it's like a conditional. I think that's a conditional pick that would be. Um, so uh, I believe they also swap second. Yes, they also swap second-round picks, uh, which moves Indy from 47th to uh, 42nd. So... On paper, this looks like a somewhat balanced trade. But to be honest, I don't really think either Indianapolis or Washington really looks all that good coming out of this. Let me explain. So if you're Indy, and if you're an Indianapolis, if you're a Colts fan, you're kind of sitting here wondering, like, wow, uh, we gave up, what was it, like two first-round picks for this guy? 
He doesn't really work out for us. And in return, we're getting two third rounders and a second rounder. I mean, a third rounder that could become a second rounder, but still. You're not getting the value that you gave up. And it's got to be a... And you're without a quarterback now. So you have that question mark as well. So, yeah, if you're a Colts fan, it's got to be a bit of a bit of a blow to the gut. You know, I mean, not that Carson Wentz w- had a great year. Uh, but, I mean, you know, he, he wasn't bad. It was just that he got hurt. And, I mean, he, you know, obviously didn't do enough to to take the Indianapolis Colts to the next level. A team like the Colts, it's in a win-now mode. I, you know, look, I thought Carson Wentz would be better, especially when he was reunited with uh, his former offensive coordinator, Frank Reich. But, eh, you know, it just didn't work. Uh, And for Washington, look, I I just kind of said it already. Like, Carson Wentz is not exactly what I would consider a Super Bowl viable quarterback. Now, I know there was the one year where he he tore his ACL. He was en route to an MVP season, and he tore his ACL. Uh, Honestly, that, unfortunately, might have just absolutely derailed his career. I mean, he just has not been the same ever since he came back from that. And for Washington... You look at this move, and you see a move that is safe, but not a move that's going to get you anywhere as far as where Washington needs to go. I don't, like I said, I don't look at Carson Wentz and see a Super Bowl winning quarterback. I look at Carson Wentz, and I see a a perfectly safe option at quarterback. Now, I think he had something like 27 touchdowns and only like seven picks last year, but but again, wasn't enough to get Indianapolis to even the playoffs, and they lost to Jacksonville. Now, not all that was on Carson Wentz, but again, look, guys, I'm just going to be real. I was not really that big on this trade for either Indy or Washington. Uh, I think, you know, not that, I don't know, it's tough. Like, I, I don't think Indy would have done themselves any favors holding on to Carson Wentz, so trading him was probably the only option to go other than releasing him, but I don't know how that would have worked for him. Um, and for like I said, for Washington, I, I, I don't look at Carson Wentz and see a guy that's going to elevate that team. I see, I see Carson Wentz as a guy who's average at best and, yeah, I mean, he isn't, you know, I don't think he's really going to do much in Washington. I don't think he's going to do any differently than he did in Indy. I don't think he's going to fare any better in Ron Rivera's system. I don't. Uh, I think he's largely going to be a game manager, and that's maybe that's what's best for him. Maybe it's better for him because, like I said, he, he uh, 27 touchdowns, only seven picks. If you're going to have a quarterback that's a game manager – you, you do need a guy that's not going to turn the ball over. And Carson Wentz is definitely that. So I could be wrong. But, yeah, I, I'm i not over the moon about this move, like I said, for either the Colts or the Commanders. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, Indy gets some draft capital back, which they did need. I, I don't think they have a first-round pick this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but now they're without a quarterback in a uh, first-round pick. So, yeah. All right, moving on to the next trade. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, the L.A. Chargers got Khalil Mack from the Chicago Bears. Now, here's a doozy for you. The Chargers get Khalil Mack, and that's, that's it as far as I know. Uh, the Chicago Bears get a 2022 second-round pick. And a 2023 six-round pick. They essentially got nothing for one of the best defensive ends in the game. So, yeah. Now, I haven't looked at Khalil Mack's numbers as of late, and I haven't even looked where he ranks as far as, like, pro football focus or anything. I'm purely going off of reputation alone on this. I think Chicago 
probably could have got more than a second round pick and a six round pick for this guy, especially since this six round pick is for next year. So, yeah, I think Chicago definitely could have did better here. I think this is one that the Chargers absolutely run away with. And just think about this. The idea of Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa on opposite ends, I think if you're a Chargers fan, you're pretty excited. And they just signed J.C. Jackson. And as a Pats fan, I can tell you, J.C. Jackson is legit. Um, now you got J.C. Jackson and Asante Samuel Jr. on opposite ends. I think the Chargers are going to be a pretty good team next year, to say the least. I said it already in the podcast. I stand by it. The AFC West is absolutely going to be the best division in football. I <clears throat> I firmly believe that. And the final trade that we're going to talk about is the Cowboys trade to the Cleveland Browns. They sent Amari Cooper and a six-round pick. Oh, wait. Yeah, Amari Cooper and a six-round pick to the Browns in exchange for a 2022 fifth-round pick and a 2022 sixth-round pick. I believe it's a 2022 uh, sixth-round pick. So, okay, this is one where we kind of knew, I mean, we knew the Cowboys had already said they were going to trade Amari Cooper, if not release him. Cowboys are way above the cap. I think the only team that's ahead of them is New Orleans, as far as, like, ahead of the cap. Um, This is a move that you kind of get the sense that the Cowboys didn't want to make. I don't think they wanted to get rid of Amari Cooper. I think they wanted to hold on to him, but it's just one of those things. They're paying Ezekiel Elliott a lot of money. They're paying Dak Prescott. Um, Yeah, and... So, trading Cooper was more of a necessity than anything, I think. And for the Cleveland Browns, I mean, you you got rid of Odell Beckham Jr. You you, you gave Jarvis Landry permission to seek a trade. You're going to need someone for Baker Mayfield to throw the ball to. And I think Amari Cooper is a pretty solid target. He's... List known as one of the best route runners in the game. At one point, he was one of the best receivers in the game. Uh, I remember a game between the Cowboys and the Patriots where he was being covered by Stephon Gilmore, and Gilmore didn't surrender one catch to him, and it was like a huge deal because Mari Cooper was like having a hell of a year that year. So Mari Cooper, his resume is there. It's it's impressive. So I think the Browns are getting a solid player as well as a draft pick. So, yeah, I mean, to be honest, guys, I think the Browns kind of won this one, and I don't really think it's close. Uh, yeah, you know, the Cowboys, they, they had to unload Amari Cooper, and they did, but, you know, what they got in return, a fifth and a sixth, maybe they could have did better. Maybe they could have at least got a fourth. Maybe a third. I don't know. It's a bit of a stretch to push for one of those, but it is what it is. Uh, but nonetheless, I do think Cleveland won this trade. And, uh, yeah, you guys can go ahead and let me know in the comment section below who you think won each of these trades between Seattle and Denver, Washington, Indianapolis, L.A., Chicago, and uh um, in uh, Dallas and Cleveland. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and let me know your comments down below on those topics. And uh, with all that said, we're going to go ahead and move on to something possibly a little controversial, but I don't think it should be. So, I'm sure we've all heard the news by now. Last Friday, Deshaun Watson stood before a jury that said uh, he will not be charged uh, criminally. He's not going to be charged criminally for all the uh, the sexual misconduct allegations that he's facing, 
Now, he is still facing a civil suit on that, and he still might have to pay money, but he's not going to face any criminal charges, which means he is eligible for trade. And I'm sure, uh, and I think it was like Houston's asking price is three first-round picks, and that's the starting asking price. So we've heard teams like New Orleans and Carolina uh, I've, I've also heard uh, Indy apparently tried to request permission, but they were denied. Go figure. Houston wouldn't want to trade Watson with within the division. So, I'm not here to talk about uh, New Orleans, Indy, or Carolina. I want to talk about why I think the Lions, that's right, the Detroit Lions should actually pick up the phone and make a request to the Houston Texans about Deshaun Watson. So first things first. things first. Detroit needs a quarterback. Sorry, but Jared Goff is not that good. Jared Goff is not the future. Deshaun Watson is a proven talent. He's a top 10 quarterback. Now, he hasn't played in a year. I understand that. But I say take the chance. He's better than Jared Goff. It also would take the Lions and almost make them an instant contender. Because if you have a guy like Deshaun Watson, that's going to attract free agents. Guys are going to want to play with him. The Lions could certainly use a guy who is going to attract free agents. Now, before anyone comes in and says, but he doesn't fit the scheme, make the scheme around him. I mean, I'm serious. I'm serious. I don't really think it's a bold claim to say, pick up the phone, make a request. Detroit has the draft capital. They got two first-round picks this year. They could send that, maybe another first-round pick for next year to Houston, and um, I don't know. Uh, maybe a player or two. They got the draft capital. They got more than enough. I think they can make the move. And I, I know, here comes the other crowd. Of, oh, well, he's got character issues. Oh, I don't want him on the team. Because I've seen that too. To which I say, get over it. Listen, I don't have to like what the guy, what the guy allegedly did. Listen, what he allegedly did was gross. He might have to pay for it. So, okay, the guy might be a scumbag. You know what? You don't got to like the guy for him to be a great quarterback on your team. I'm not asking you to make a role model out of the guy. I'm not asking you to worship the ground he walks on. I'm just asking you to be open-minded enough to actually give give him a chance. At least push the Lions, push the Ford family to actually... Try something bold. Because I'm going to be honest, guys. I don't think many Lions fans out there have much of a right to be saying like, oh, no, we're, we're not going to do that. Check your Lombardi, uh, check your trophy case. There is not one Lombardi in there. You want a Lombardi in there? You got to make bold moves. And sometimes that means taking a chance on a guy who has a bit of a checkered past. You know what? I can look to my team as an example. Guys like Randy Moss, Rodney Harrison, Corey Dillon, these are guys who had some issues. Rodney Harrison was called the dirtiest player in the league. Corey Dillon had a whole bunch of stuff that followed him throughout his, I mean, both his life and his playing career. Um, And uh, Randy Moss, same thing. You know, had a bit of a bad reputation in the league, was known as a loudmouth. Um... I, I think he also had a couple run-ins with the law. I'm not sure about that. I was a kid when Randy Moss first entered the league. But, um, yeah, I know when he came to New England, his reputation wasn't... More or less, it was it was that he had a bad reputation and also that he was washed up. But New England took a risk, and it paid off. I mean, granted, Randy Moss didn't win a ring, but Rodney Harrison, Corey Dillon, they both got rings. The point is, when you make bold moves and you take a chance, sometimes on players that are considered toxic, good things happen. 
And I think for the Lions and for the Fords, I think they just get way too wrapped up in their image. And again, I, I think if you're a fan, look, like I said, you don't have to like Deshaun Watson personally to be like, hey, he's a damn good quarterback, and I, I think he can do some good stuff here in Detroit. So I'm just saying, like, if, if I were a Lions fan, I would be demanding better of the Fords. I'd be demanding better. And I, I think this would be a really good opportunity. I think this would be huge. If the Lions really wanted to make a splash here, this would be the way to do it. And again, I think it would take the rebuild and it would just shoot it forward. And it, I mean, shit, you probably wouldn't even need to call it a rebuild. It'd be an instant contender. Think about that. The Lions as possible playoff contenders. I'm just saying... It's possible, but unfortunately, I haven't read any articles or any reports. Uh, Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, nothing, nothing from the free press or the news about the Lions even attempting to make an offer for Deshaun Watson. And look, at the end of the day, I just I, I think that's a mistake on the Lions' part, and I think they'll uh, they may grow to regret that one, but. We'll see. All right, so next thing I want to talk about, we're going to keep it local here. We're going to talk about the Detroit Tigers and uh, why I think they uh, they should still sign Carlos Correa, why they realistically they could probably afford it. You know, I know Correa is going to want a lot of money, but so think about this. I know they just signed uh, Javi Baez, not too long ago, and I actually uh, had pulled up their uh, their payroll. Let me uh, let's just go ahead and pull that up again. I think this is it right here. No, this ain't it. Here it is. So this is uh, fangraphics.com, and this talks about team payrolls. So the estimated payroll for the Detroit Tigers this year is going to be 119 mil. So, I think the uh, the luxury tax is up to 200 mil for this year. I'm not sure. It might be 220 mil. I, I haven't looked at it in a while. In other words, the Tigers are nowhere near the tax threshold, and they can still spend some money. Now, I know I mentioned Javi Baez, so you're probably thinking, well, they already signed a shortstop. Well, think about this. They could still sign Carlos Correa, and they could put Baez at second. He's a gold glove second baseman. So, yeah, they could absolutely do it. Not to mention, if you sign a player like Carlos Correa, and you're, yeah, it, it might be one of those things where you're taking on like a 10 year contract, 10 years, 300 mil would be reportedly what he's looking for. But in all honesty, you could probably give him a contract where he's making about 35 to 40 mil a year, and maybe it's for like eight years, maybe it's for seven years. I don't know. Um, I think he would take it. And look, Cabrera's contract is up after 2023, I think. I think he's an unrestricted free agent after uh, after next year. So you won't have to worry about having that contract on your payroll after 2023. So in the Tigers' position, it's kind of a low-risk, high-reward move to still sign Carlos Correa. But probably not going to happen and the reason I say that is because uh, a report I think it was from the athletic it just came out sometime last week that both AJ Hinch and Al Avila wanted Carlos Correa and were prepared to bust out the checkbook but Chris Illich did not want to take on another big contract, so to speak, to put it in layman's terms. To be honest, that drove me up a wall when I heard that. It did. 
let's get something straight. A game like baseball, the MLB, is not something you can be cheap and expect to win a World Series in. You have to spend money. You have to have a payroll. At least if you're looking to get more than one World Series, look at the Red Sox. Look at the, I, I think the Astros have a pretty big payroll too. Look at the Yankees. Look at the Dodgers. These are teams that are consistently competing and they all have high payrolls. Now I know the Athletics, the Rays, you know, they try to be cheap and I mean, I think the Rays made the World Series a couple of years back, a few years back against the Dodgers or something like that. I don't know. Um, but it, it rarely ever works. You know what? I don't think it's going to work for the Tigers. So why Chris Illich doesn't want to bust out the checkbook and spend money is anyone's guess. But to be honest, it makes me angry. Because that is Chris Illich being a tightwad for no goddamn reason whatsoever. No good reason. I can't stand it. I hate it, quite frankly. I want to say something perfectly clear. You own a baseball team and you want to win. Guess what? You have to spend money, Chris. You have to. You can't shy away from it. You have to spend money. Your payroll is going to be big. Otherwise, don't own a baseball team. It's very simple, Chris. It's very simple. Don't own a baseball team if you don't want to spend money. But this is ridiculous. This dude honestly thinks that he's going to, like, you think you're going to get something out of this by going the cheap route? It's not going to happen. The only thing that we can hope for is that the Tigers draft well and that their prospects all come together and develop nicely. Otherwise, we're not going to be seeing a World Series under Chris Illich because he's too afraid to spend money. Scared money don't make money, Chris. You want to own a baseball team? You got to spend money. It's just that simple. So, to kind of wrap it back around before we move on, I do think the Tigers should sign Carlos Correa to a contract where he's making 35 to 40 million a year. Screw it. Take a chance. Spend the money. Because even then, you wouldn't be, the Tigers' payroll would not even be at league average. I don't think. I mean, again, I'd have to look at the numbers, but they would still be able, if they're only paying Correa 40 mil a year, tack that on to the 119, that only takes your, let me see, like 40 mil, it'd be 159. It'd be 159 mil, and that's still under league average. You're not even paying 200 mil at that point. So, yeah, Chris, open up the checkbook. Let A.J. Hinch and Al Avila do their thing. Just let them do it. Come on, Chris. All right, guys. Time for the best part of the podcast, and that is the embarrassing story. So, for this one... This one's actually pretty recent. Like, this actually happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, And when it's done, there's probably one thing you guys are going to be thinking. And that's, damn, I can't let Justin work on my car. (laughs) Okay, so, it's a couple of weeks ago. I was at work, and I was eating lunch. My boss randomly walked up to me and said, Hey, Justin, when you get a chance, could you uh, could you take my car around to the back and fill the tires? Um, uh, to kind of give you guys an idea, I work at a print shop, and uh, we have, like, these, uh, we have, like, air, we have an air compressor in the back of the shop, um, and we have a bunch of, like, uh, nozzles that are specifically made to help fill the air and, car tires. So my boss wanted me to drive his truck around and fill his tires. So my, uh, my coworker gives me the gauge, gives me the nozzle to put on the thing to pump air in the tire, you know, whatever. 
long story short, I <laughs> I ended up over over inflating the tires, both of them. In one case, almost double the amount of PSI that it could hold. Like an idiot. <laughs> and I drove it back around. Now, thankfully, the tires didn't explode. And uh, my boss, uh, we found out. I, I mentioned it to my coworker about the tires. And I had said, like, I, I let the dial, the, the gauge, go all the way to the to the end. And he was like, Dude, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to stop between 30 and 40. To kind of give you guys an idea, I do know how to fill air in tires. It's just I would always I would always use this method that my dad taught me, which was uh, where you would just kind of press on it with your own hand, and if you couldn't, you know, like put any pressure on it, it's it's filled. I now see that that's not a good way to fill your tires with air. <laughs> As this story is kind of is kind of uh, making that obvious, um, <laughs> so my coworker asks me, and I told him I, I filled the gauge, and he was like, "Dude, you're not supposed to do that." So, luckily, my boss hadn't left. We were able to get out there and and let the air out. Um, and my coworker, you know, my boss was cool about it. We all just kind of laughed about it, but I I, <laughs> I was was super embarrassed i mean i i felt like such an idiot uh if it's not obvious i'm not much of a grease monkey so yeah i don't I literally don't know anything about cars like nothing so i was just thankful that nothing bad happened you know nothing happened to my boss's truck nothing happened to his tires nothing happened to, to him while he was driving it nothing like that um, we were able to catch it before any danger or anything bad happened, thankfully. Um, and yeah, I, I, I was just happy that he, uh, that my, my boss didn't flip the hell out on me. <laughs> that could have been really bad. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, guys, that's all I have for you today for this edition of Cujo's Corner. Uh, let me know your thoughts, your opinions down below on each of the topics we talked about today. And, uh, yeah, until next time, I'm Justin Crumley saying, stay awesome. If you enjoyed this video from Cujo Productions, please consider subscribing. Check out my Red Bubble page for all my merch. And hit the bell icon so that you're notified for every time I upload a video. As always, stay awesome, guys.